Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Neil and Jordan podcast, the podcast where two comedians talk like experts on subjects they are not experts on. This is part two of the Social Capital podcast. So go and listen to part one if you haven't already. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by Crush Organic CBD Oil. Go to crushorganics.com, crush with a K. Use the code Neil for 40% off. That's nearly 50%. That's nearly half. So what are you waiting for? Go to crushorganics.com. Use the code Neil for 40% off. Get some of that sweet, sweet platinum CBD oil, diamond CBD oil, CBD oil for your pets, bath bombs, gummies, pain creams, whatever the hell you want. They got it all. It's like Charlie and the CBD factory. So go to crushorganics.com. Use the code Neil for 40% off. All right. Enjoy part two of the Social Capital Podcast. Because it doesn't fit someone else's narrative, they they perceive it to be dangerous when that second school of thought, which I'm firmly a member of, is that, okay, let every opinion, let every narrative be aired out, let everyone be exposed to different opinions and different ideas, and let people come to their own conclusions. And if you're so afraid of other people's opinions, well, then your opinion needs to be improved upon your way of conversing and your ability to persuade needs improvement true and you know what else as well i will say this because it's it's that's sort of uh because I used to always think, like, you know, I see the merit in the other people just saying, like, you should be stamping out wrong opinions. Not that I think you should be stamping out wrong opinions, but I see the merit in it when you're trying to get society to move in one direction. I guess, actually, if anything, it would be COVID because that's the thing where you really want everyone to move one way. But when it comes to something like climate change, for instance, the, the polls are out, like... The, the people that don't believe in climate change is pretty much exactly the same as the people that don't believe in fucking the, the, the earth revolving around the sun. You know, like it's, it's, it's gotten to that level. It's, it's really close. There's always just this 10% of the population that doesn't believe any scientific theory for whatever reason, right? The, the reason that that was actually kept for so long is because there was sort of gatekeepers in the press. But actually, when you let that message kind of just proliferate around the internet, very quickly the polling actually just went, no, actually, no, it is it is definitely fucking <laughs> happening, you know? Right. Like what Boy did was being able to gatekeep who got to communicate and who didn't. Yeah. And now that's an example of... Okay, that, that, it's always there's this there's this conflation between people expressing, you know, something that is objectively incorrect or at least close to being objectively incorrect, and that's often unfairly conflated with someone who is uh, seeing the same set of facts but having a different opinion from the mainstream consensus. So someone who's saying, "All right, climate change is not real," is different to someone who's saying, "No, it is real," but I think. Uh, economic development is the most important thing and we shouldn't try and uh, move towards renewables. Like, that's an opinion that should be heard. Mm. Now, people then have the right to say, oh, well, that's a stupid opinion, but that that is not disinformation. That's an opinion based on a given set of facts. Yeah. So that's different. That's often conflated with someone who's saying, like, you know, oh, look, no, nah, it's all fake and it's all a Chinese conspiracy or something like that. Like, it's not fair to put those two people in the same boat. Right, 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 right. So, yeah, but say, wait, what's, COVID, what's like, huh? say, okay, yeah, just yeah. like to COVID, for example, like there was, sure, there was a range of opinions that strayed from the mainstream narrative, which went all the way from, okay, it's completely fake and it's a Chinese implanted or Bill Gates implanted it to put microchips in our head. All the way to, hey, we shouldn't have lockdowns for these philosophical reasons. Mm. Now, wherever that line is, that's also subjective. Mm. And so because it's subjective, I'm inclined to just say, well, there shouldn't be a line then. Because now I know it's it's a messy situation because there are costs and benefits both ways here. But 
There have been instances previously, say, in my... Now, I'm not trying to say I'm an authority on this by any means, but all I can say is there have been instances where I've previously thought, all right, this is the realm of acceptable discourse and anything beyond that is just absurd. I've then read new things, I've understood things in a more complex and nuanced way, and I've realized, oh, no, it's actually far more expansive than that. Now, if that's happening to every single person, I can then... Uh, that that humbled me to a, to a large degree to the point where I said... Oh, well, who, who is anyone to say this is the realm of acceptable opinion? This is the realm of acceptable thought. It's better to just have no line there. Now, that does unfortunately leave the, da- the door slightly ajar for people who just express things that may be completely objectively wrong even. But there and there's a cost to that. There may even be quite a large cost to that. But the overall benefit for allowing all those nuanced and complex views to... Uh, potentially proliferate or at least promulgate within the culture scape, that's, that benefit outweighs the cost. Yeah, you know what? Massively. What you're actually describing there is, and everyone's heard this before, but it is it's the, it's the Overton window. Yeah. That's the Overton window. It is. And yeah. that's what's really... That is a terrible thing that that exists. I, I truly do think that that is one of the most evil inventions humanity's ever created but then again this just goes back to the point that i'm always coming banging on about which is just like it really it it does it just freaks me out a lot when i think like exactly what you're saying like i thought the world was that way but it's actually that way and that's always a very scary realization to come to and the only way you're able to have those sorts of red pill moments is that you are able to be exposed to ideas that have traditionally been perceived to be outside of that acceptable Overton window of discourse. Yeah, exactly. Because and so as soon yeah. as you solidify that Overton window and say there is punitive measures that may be taken for people who express views outside of that window, you are uh, precluding the possibility of ever, you personally, but for anyone to have those similar red pill moments and to further nourish and edify the populace and, and move society forward. Hmm. I guess you're also keeping the window open for people who are stupid, sure, but that's a cost you have to pay. Yeah, but the thing is their view gets discounted fairly quickly. Yeah, you actually need to have faith in, like, the basic intelligence of uh, the collective. And as much as we mock the stupidity of the collective, I think I have, you know, basic faith in you know, the wisdom of the crowd to say that, okay, if there are opinions that may be nefarious or pernicious in the long term, they will be discarded. Or at the very least, they may be implemented and then we will learn from that and actually gain more wisdom from having experienced that. Yeah. Well, the thing is actually, like, if you look at it, you, you will be surprised how often you agree with the crowd because you are the crowd, you know. Yeah. There is a great book called, like, The Wisdom of Crowds, and it does just talk about that. It's, it's, it's exactly what we're saying, really, which is that once an idea goes past that marketing buzz phase, well, actually, Bill Maher was pointing this out, and I was just like, fuck, really? But apparently Donald Trump has lost a lot of popularity with his core demographic. Well, because he's pro, he's pro vaccine. Do you reckon that's the reason? I mean, it could it's probably be partly that, and also cut off. He from oxygen. relied on yeah. He relied on just constantly being. What he relied on was essentially weaponizing the uh, the uh, the shock in the offense of the what is often described as the liberal elite responding to his outlandish tweets. So he would tweet something outlandish, and then. Obviously, the, the, the response to that would be completely disproportionate to what he said. And then he relied on weaponizing that and saying, see, look how, look how much they look down on people who speak like us. Mm. I think that was a big part of it. Mm. And mm. so that cycle has been broken since he's been taken off social media. Mm. In the same way, ScoMo is weaponizing the, what I would probably describe as a disproportionate response to his foibles. Because some people go way overboard on the internet and say, yeah, he's a, he's a cunt, he should be beheaded or whatever the fuck. And it's like, all right, look, he played the guitar badly, but still, <laughs> he's weaponizing that by saying, look how mean the internet is. 
Mm. And I think Donald Trump did that, but just sort of in an inverse way and saying like, hey, look how pretentious and out of touch the liberal elite are. And he isn't, hasn't been able to do that. Now, I'd, I'd, that social media ban was two years. I wonder what's going to happen. It's been a year now, and I wonder in 11 months if they're going to reinstate him because there's actually a commercial interest that may want him back is those cable news channels have lost an crazy amount of ratings in America because they just relied on a commentary about him. I mean, dude, if they were commercial, you, you would really see if they are commercial or ideological outfits at that point to see which way they swing on it. Because if they're purely profit-driven, they'd actually they have a vested Trump. interest in wanting him back. But if yeah. they're ideological, then... Uh, Look, I guess that's actually probably the reason that he actually has lost uh, popularity. That's my guess. I don't I'm know. guessing it's probably it. But the thing is, he's another. I mean, dude, that is a social capital president right there. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, at some point, his image started to get managed, and yes, he had other people around him. But the, the, the you know, you hear all these genius strategists and stuff like that, and they will say that, you know, there's two types of candidates. There's bull in the china shop ones, and then there's, you know, just someone that is just a little monkey with a chain on them, you know. Right. And there's only so much that you can do to move that man. So I think that actually, yeah, again, people were just going up onto his authenticity, and I think it's the same thing again. He was kind of just like, I have a vision for the world. Here it is. Having said that, though, he had a little bit of a vision for the world before that, which was just like, I don't like migration. I don't like trade. But Steve Bannon was the one that kind of shifted it and gave it that. And he was he had the charisma, I suppose, to deliver that message better. But it still comes down to the point that social capital comes from. He is a boulder. Let's move it up this hill. I think that's where social capital comes from. Yeah, I think that's one metaphor that can certainly describe it, but I, I just think it's can be broadly defined as, yeah, it's deeper than trust. I think- It's faith. Trust is, the, yeah, yeah. It's faith. Faith in the goodwill of a given individual. Yeah. That's very powerful. Because it's definitely something there where you're just like- We're social animals. Look, I- There's all these- Because, you know, it's it's very, very trendy on the net to constantly be hitting Elon Musk. But I'm always just thinking every time I see it, and this is when you know that someone's going to have good social capital. It's just like, why are you hitting that cunt? Like, of all the fucking people on planet Earth to hit, why the fuck would you be pointing out that guy's deficiencies? You know, like it just, it actually is at some point it's kind of just like, this is bad on you. You know, like, okay, yeah, he, uh, like, I obviously believe in unions v- extremely strongly and like people are just saying like, oh, you know, pay his workers adequately and shit like that. And it's just like, dude, he's basically without the Australian government here even setting up anything for electric vehicles, he sort of set up electric vehicle stations everywhere here. Every fucking 50th car that you look at now here is a Tesla. And that was drive with a government actively trying to keep electric vehicles off the road. And yet in spite of that, he's moving the needle forward regardless. It's just like, Jesus Christ, can you pick a a bigger fucking demon? You know, like- yeah. A, a better demon, sorry. Well, yeah. Well, this is where, you know, the, the, the sort of nuances of that anti-capitalist mentality comes in where people, I think, just blindly say billionaire bad. And you can you can criticise the system and you can criticise the fact that maybe he has made some poor economic choices in regards to his workers, but the vision that man has and what he's already accomplished, I mean, it's unheard of. No no one human being has done anything like that. And if he really does set up this self-sustaining colony on Mars, no, that is, he will go down in history as, as the most famous human of all time. I mean, who's mm. going to do that? That's, that's mm. quite literally colonizing another planet. That is mm. remarkable. Mm. And then all these stupid people on the net, well, what about we save this planet? Yeah, we can do both. But that is so, like, there's a sense of wonder and, and, and just... 
Oh, like that, I can't even. It just appeals to the human spirit. The this the the grandeur and the and the amazement that I I feel when I I think about humans going to another planet is, I mean it it. it you know, I would get emotional if I spoke about it too much because that's just something that there's very few things that actually inspire the human spirit. Is like a, it's the same thing as like you can't not think it when you think about someone landing on the moon. You know, you can't you can't not be proud of the human race and not think about that. Yeah, and there's very few things that are like that in the world. I mean, it's one of those situations where everyone's going to criticize, and if he if he does it everyone is going to be looking in unison as a global population in pure amazement at a man who is or a woman who is stepping onto another planet that may and according to him is going to happen in 2026 now i don't know about that i'm skeptical but man i hope it happens what i'll be 32 fuck Mad. Yeah, I mean, it would be like, yeah, Jesus Christ. It is something because th- this is the whole thing. Every time you think about someone doing that, you always think, I'll be dead before that happens. Or well, if this timeline fits. No. Well, see, this is the whole thing that actually this is the other thing. And I guess they've just moved on to the next part is what you were saying, which is that I think billionaires have figured out that they are the modern day kings of Europe. That's what they are. They're, they're the ones that mm. the, the the possession of some of these people that are in Silicon Valley is more than developed countries at this point. Like their companies oh, yeah. are worth more than a fucking developed nation would be, yeah. right? And so they are quite literally kings of Europe. They, they, yeah, <laughs> they, they literally are, are just they basically are. the Prince of Luxembourg or something, you know? Like because they have the same re- you know, they have the same reach of resources. And so and I think that they, they have an army essentially. They could, you know, if they wanted to, they could. And that's the whole thing. I think that they, and, and the other thing is that what's really interesting about it is that they've moved on to the point where they actually don't need an army because they're, so it's a, it's a strange point in history where there's all of those things that used to be of upkeep that you don't really need any of that anymore, except for an accountant and a shares portfolio. And now you have access to directing the same resources and I suppose that that's the way that you would look at Elon Musk when he is saying, when, when people are saying, why don't you solve all the problems on planet Earth? It's just like, well, that one particular kingdom is thinking about colonizing Mars. And you That's know, not an excuse for all the other ones, but like, car. for fuck's sake, there are a lot. Like, okay, all, you want some fucked cunts in the world. Go to Saudi Arabia. Like, it's exactly like they're yeah. just fuckwits with like 500 Ferraris. That just yeah. go and play them like their demolition derby on the on the fucking weekend, and just you know keep pet lions that they ride around with a saddle and shit. There's worse fucking billionaires than Elon Musk, and like their goals in life are a lot worse than trying to get to Mars. And they got it purely from nepotism, and the Russian oligarchs, by all accounts, are the same. They haven't really done anything noteworthy or built anything they've just no just purely destructive like using yeah. that money to make the world a worse place well, they go yeah they they visit lavish hotels and have those illuminati sex parties that's what they do yeah and on top of that like dude i think elon musk i'm sure the tech billionaires probably do too but they also i don't think they do i think they're just so beyond sex that they just <laughs> well elon musk has a, he dates a pretty uh he had a child with Grimes or some some. Yeah, like see, that's singer. the whole thing, right? Like, if I had access to any woman on the planet, I wouldn't be choosing Grimes. So, yeah, I mean, different yeah. strokes for different strokes, but she does look like an onion. I'm a big fan of her music. I'm a huge fan of her latest <laughs> album. But um, they like him doing that of just going to Mar- like, even if you discount that, I think he's earned it in what he's done to electrify the world's transport grid, essentially. Like, he's really kick-started it. And that's the whole thing. Again, with the nation stuff, I'm pissed off about it with our government, but our government had the opportunity to do all that shit. But Elon Musk hoovered up a lot of our scientists and gave them a job, so at least someone was. Yeah, right. I I guess that's the whole thing. 
Huh? Yeah. Well, that's a man with... Um, well, that's what he's doing with his capital. resources. Yeah. It, and well, he's the second richest man. I think he's the moving planet. to the next point of, yeah, okay, if I accumulate social capital, then like money. It's very interesting. He's kind of like reached the peak of money yeah. as a game. And now he's moved into anti money, which is this thing of just like, I guess what you're pointing out now as well is just like, we are in a world now where money is becoming quite fucking Fuck. cheap. <laughs> yeah. fucked cheap like Volatile. it doesn't mean what it used to mean no it's like i was reading this the other day that like in the middle ages gold was a lot more valuable than it is now sure of course it would be because there's just way less of it resources were so hard to come by and then if if the entire globe is lifted out of absolute poverty which is realistic in the next couple of decades from what i've read mm. don't know how true that is but uh, if we're talking about everyone having their basic needs met, just food, water, shelter, and, like, you know, some basic level of medical care, which is not an un- – well, maybe the medical care, we'll, we'll take that off the table, but basic food and water this and, and, you know, energy. How much of the world doesn't have those three things or at least some – degree of access to those three things. I mean, there'd be some areas in Africa, sure, and, and South America, I'm assuming, but I think most of the world is getting their basic needs met. And then, yeah, the value of money, when the when the supply of, well, not just money, we're talking about just sort of resources because money was always a way to sort of, you know, it's a sort of transactional mediary between resources, essentially. And so when all those resources are becoming less valuable, in a sense, because the supply of them is so high, well then, well, then people move on to other forms of value. And I think that other form that we're seeing is social capital. And I think even, look, in a country like Australia where people already are saying, when, when, if someone just, you know, openly talks about their salary, people will be like, this guy's a fucking wanker. You know, like already this is a, this is a country where people really admire social capital and someone who has built trust within their peer group or their office or where, wherever it may be. I mean, this, and they're almost grateful and they're almost what the, the money then comes as a result, but that's not the reason you do that. But ironically, if you were chasing money, you'd want to chase social capital. But again, like that's not the reason you should do it. But, uh, I don't think chasing social capital is a, nefarious uh value to pursue because i think in in accruing that you need to build people's trust and by doing and to build people's trust you have to be you have to be altruistic you have to be trustworthy you have to have leadership qualities you have to have opinions that are helping people you have to, people have to feel like you your existence adds to their existence now that's that's priceless that's very valuable and so you have to actually become a good person to do that. Mm, yeah. Okay. So basically, fuck. Okay. So really, human beings have become the gold. Trust has become the the gold. Trust has become the gold. But well, then, what's the human? But I maybe the bank. I guess it's, yeah. We're getting really abstract. But like, it's just as you're saying, it's like money has always been used as a method to reallocate resources from one place to the other. But essentially, really, the way that you are gaining trust is by reallocating resources from one place to the other in a way that is beneficial. Sure. You know how you always say charismatic people are people who can sort of build self-worth and self-esteem within someone they're talking to and, and actually, whether consciously or, or purposefully, they're, they're, they're sort of, there's an aura of respect and with that comes a sort of elevation of the person within their immediate vicinity yes simply by focusing in on them and responding to what they say in an admirable way that is so valuable and and in this era of you know horrific self-esteem that's incredibly valuable because hmm. everyone now has their like a lot at least in western countries and i mean, look I know, in certain areas in america and, and the uk and, and australia as well i'm not trying to avoid the fact that there are people 
that there are definitely people who are struggling financially. But again, when we're talking about those basic needs, you know, and unless you're in Australia for the 99.9% of people, I'm, I'm just, this is a guess again, I do apologize if I get this wrong, but people have access to food and water and shelter and the government will provide that if you don't. Hmm. Okay. Now it doesn't have, doesn't necessarily mean it's good shelter, good food, but really that's what you need to, what you need to survive will be taken care of. So then what do you search for after that's been covered? You search for status, you search for meaning, you search for purpose and ultimately sure financial capital can contribute to those things but what will really contribute to that is is social capital because it's a sort of it's a consequence of of achieving many of those things so it's the same as say like guys who sit there and like chase women right like that should come the ability for for women or and even conversely women who then go around chasing a lot of men like if you want to be attractive to the opposite sex it's counterintuitive you shouldn't actually be trying to to get laid what you should be doing is trying to build yourself up to the point where, like, people naturally are want naturally to attracted you. to yes. your gravitational pull, right? Yes. So that's similarly, I think, with the social capital, you are then going to attract a lot of resources, whether that may be, you know, reflexively other people are, are want to uh, intertwine their social capital with your social capital, but also maybe their financial capital because they trust their financial capital with you because you have that immense degree of social capital. And I just think uh, more analysis may, you know, it'd be interesting to sort of quantify something like social capital. You know how there's the, obviously there's the Forbes rich list. They do have some, you know, they have like the celebrity, most influential people, but let's be honest, the people who make those lists are people in that sort of old world. They're saying these are the people who are the most influential. Like, you know, you look at these lists of the most influential people in Australia. I haven't heard any of them. They're these sort of business leaders who no one fucking knows about unless they're in that industry. But um, if they had a proper, accurate list of... And, and we're not just talking about influence here. We're talking about faith and trust. And I think they're deeper than just influence because someone, you know, a, a, a notable sports person in Australia may have a lot of influence. But if they start speaking on a on a very uh complex serious issue people are going to think all right come on idiot yeah whereas i would define social capital as someone who may not have be as recognizable a name but uh have a large degree of people uh, sorry a large uh they've amassed a, a a crowd that have faith in what they have to say and and trust their vision and do you think that you know what it actually is? You know, what yeah. faith, the, the breeding ground of faith is. What? It's trust that the intentions of the person are good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the trust of goodwill, sure. Trust of goodwill. It's it's this, dude. Again, I'm gonna have to do it. Busy teens. No, I want to explore this across different pr- through different prisms. So go for it. Dark Ages Europe, as you learned about in the Jordan Shank show, not a good place. Just fucking horrible. Yep. Uh, basically, just a terrible life expectancy. Bone samples show that you were malnourished and malformed as a result, uh, and that's if you lived. Uh, essentially, what kings were back then was more or less warlords. The thing that I've found that is remarkable about the Byzantine Empire and what I've found, like, and, and this is why people like Kevin Rudd and my lawyer, all these really learned men that I know, they're still just everyone smarts about the fall of Constantinople. And I, I found out that it's basically because it was a fortress of all the ideas of Europe up until that point before it descended into just utter chaos. And then they just put it all behind this impenetrable fortress that was the result of the Roman Empire just using their incredible logistics, uh, knowledge of logistics, their incredible knowledge of just fortifications, their incredible knowledge of geography to basically make this impenetrable city that could not be fucking penetrated for a thousand years. And behind that, they put their vault of all of their ideas, all of their culture, uh, all of the science, all of that was just put behind that wall. 
So it kind of acted as a time vault until the rest of Europe could catch up again. Mm, wow. It was just a thousand years of just absolute chaos. So, like, the, the more I think about it, the more I'm just like, Jesus, they sacrificed hard for that. And then I started thinking about why. Then I started reading a book about it. And emperors back then, under the Byzantines, it was actually a lot more democratic than you thought. Like, you think of an emperor as just being this kind of anointed monarch. Mm. really what was happening behind the wall there was because it was just, there was so much pressure. They were constantly getting eaten at, as I was saying, there was just an endless, essentially what it was, was just Germany and World War I, but for a thousand years. Like they were fighting a front constantly on two sides. There's a constant total war that was happening. To be emperor, people had to trust that you were, and they actually had this even phrase, which is just fucking phenomenal for the time, because again, the rest of Europe, like every other king essentially was just a warlord, right? And the warlord, it was just understood that they'd go, they'd try and conquer territory, and then you had to fucking pay tribute to that conqueror because he had the biggest army there. The concept in the Byzantine Empire was, and this is fucking incredible, it blows my mind, I thought that it would have been something like that. The un the general understanding that the everyone had there was that they were part of something special and that there was something called a, it was just the Tao. It was like the greater good. And it was very important for an emperor to be seen as doing something in the interest of the of the empire. Like it wasn't it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't you're supposed to be serving me like it was everywhere else in Europe. Mm. It was I'm here to serve the people of the empire. <laughs> like I'm contributing to a greater good. You have to contribute to a greater good. That's what kept that thing going for so long. And so essentially you realize because it was just this constant question that just didn't exist in a bunch of other places of like legitimacy and how do you maintain the, the position of being emperor. Dude, it was pretty much the same as being Elon Musk. You had to be seen doing things that were in the interest of the public. And as soon as they didn't think that you were doing the things in the interest of the public, you were taken out and you were executed. Or you, executed. you had your eyes poked out. Or like- Jesus. <laughs> the the eyes poked out. They were really into that. It was yeah, fucked. They it was loved horrible. that in the dark ages, didn't they? And they loved that. And that was the civilized place. That was, <laughs> and that was seen as civilized as well. That was like, they were just Fucking like, we're being hell. merciful. We're letting you live. Well, I mean, in the, you know, what were they doing? Hung, drawn and quartered and all that shit. Jeez. Boiled alive. Yuck. All that shit. Burnt. Ugh. But I think that the same thing applied. Now that I think about it, it was that. It was just like the, the way that you attained emperorship back then was social capital. The way that you got things done back then, what actually was more valuable than gold amongst the empire anyway, gold was actually very valuable for just buying off your enemies. But within the empire, it was that idea of like, we're doing this for a greater cause. It was like what I was reading to you with that general, for instance, how it was just like, you, you don't start war unless you know that God's on your side first. Like there's, there was always some greater purpose to what they were doing. That was very heavily drilled into their mind. Hmm. And that resulted in, because like you think about it, the period that they had, climate change, massive climate change happened. That's why the Roman Empire collapsed because you just had all of this area greening up here. So you had, uh, sorry, freezing over. So you had these huge hordes just pushing their way into Europe. That caused that half to collapse. That caused this part to just shrink into nothing. They had this huge Islamic state that never existed before that was fanatical, constantly that had no concept other than uh, if you don't assimilate to Islam, like, there is just a never ending war. That's why the, that front was always there. That front was always there because there was just constant step people, which is just everything from fucking basically China to here of people that were just barbarian horsemen, just hundreds of thousands of them coming in all the time. <sighs> Climate change was happening. Oh there was no one else civilized to trade with really. Like the rest of it was all just backwards cave people essentially here, like a little bit better than cave people. And amidst all of that, they stood strong for a thousand years. It's it's actually- wow. and, and like, if they didn't, this is the thing that really freaks me out. If they didn't, there's no fucking chance we'd be here. No chance. Like I was saying in yeah. the, the, the Roman Empire thing, right? Like after the Roman Empire collapsed, for London to get back to what it was, it took 1,800 years. 
if Constantinople fell before that and that information was just wiped off the face of the planet, who the fuck knows how long it would have taken well, to get back to some stage of normal, like what we have now. Wasn't there a very large library in Alexandria that was burnt down? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then they know, built and another know, one and, and then that got burnt was, down. And we don't know what was it. There was apparently like no. a large proportion of uh, uh, ancient Greek philosophy and, and, and thinking that that went down with it. Yeah. Who burnt it? I think it was the Vandals. I think the Vandals burnt it. But then I think, again, like it was built up a little bit by the Byzantines, but then it came in and then the Arabs burnt it again. But the, the other thing wow. as well is like that, okay, everyone knows that as the big loss and it is the big loss. But in the Roman Empire, there was huge, massive libraries all over Europe and they're all disappeared as well. Basically, the only massive libraries that survived the Middle Ages were in Constantinople. Why and, like, if that went, where the fuck would we be? Yeah. Where would we be? Well, just, just, the, 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 oh, my God, there's such an importance of preserving the written word. Yeah. and Because it's like you're thinking the thousands ideas of years. Of civilization, they need to be preserved. Need to be preserved. Now it's a lot easier because now we've got data and so it kind of just never doesn't not exist. Yeah, well, you never know. If someone wanted to purge the internet of certain things, the AI is getting so strong that you could type in a word and just get rid of this all across the internet. I'm sure that AI could exist in a matter of decades. So Yeah, true. Look, you probably uh, want to back it up on some hard copies too. Get yeah, some get USBs, some floppy disks, yeah. Get a time get a time. <laughs> get, 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 some floppy get those time capsules. Yeah, <laughs> chuck that in. Right on a scroll. Yeah. Get Put a bit that of in everything there. going. Yeah. Um that's remarkable. But I think that, yeah, it was just, now that I think about it, it was the, the way that an emperor got there and stayed there was exactly what we're talking about here. It was just like, I have this vision for how we can benefit. Let's go this way. Hmm. And if it worked, he got to stay as emperor. If he didn't, he got dragged down from the crowds because they didn't have the luxury of fucking around. Yeah, and now you have- uh sort of cabal of elites who think appealing to the masses means there's actually a, some sort of fault in your personality. Yeah, yeah. They really look down and deride the, the masses. That's at least the feeling a lot of people get. Or, or well, they, it's true, they, it's there. They look to uh, focus groups and, and consultants to tell Trick them em. what to say hmm. in order to get them on the side. I mean, that's something... I remember after the 2016 election, my friend was saying, oh, you know, Hillary was so competent that she actually needed people to help her speak because she was so hyper-focused on her work and she needed aides to, to uh, move her in the right direction when she was conversing with people. And I thought that's the last person you want as the leader of a giant population, someone who can't even speak to the people that they should be beholden to. People hate it. And the a, a great example. I mean, it's it's very simple. This no one, trust like can the, be built. Yeah, the That's way why. that that politician was running away from the old Aussie Cossack. <laughs> well, it, it's the, the weakest. It's it's immediately like if you see that you are there is no way that you are going to have a high opinion of her afterwards. Yeah, this is not going to happen. Sure. Now I don't know how big and intimidating this man is, but. Uh, Oh, yeah, he's got that going for him. Something to be said about standing your ground and being able to talk to people even if they are heated. And there was that riot, not riot, that demonstration, whatever you want to call it, in Melbourne with the, what was it, the tradies against the union or something that were like throwing bottles at John Setka or whatever. Mm. But to his credit, he stood out there and he had a yeah, megaphone. Like, you want to like, fight? Yeah. Yeah, like, fucking, all right, let's go. Like, there's some, yeah. there's, a, there's a respect. Now, I do, a, I would say, I'd imagine if you are like a sort of more petite female in that situation, you'd want to preserve, you'd, you'd, there'd be a greater degree of fear there, uh, even if you were just a smaller man. <laughs> but at the same time, then maybe you shouldn't be in, in, in politics, if you can't handle the the masses, the ire of the masses, because that's ire that you would have contributed to, hmm. and you have to be able to face the music. Yeah, that's definitely tr look. Or at the very least, at the very least, just don't give them the opportunity to do it. It's very stupid in this day. It actually just does show that they haven't cottoned on to what reality is. Reality used to be she'd sit out there at the park, 
maybe some old biddy couple would come along and then just talk to her about like, are you going to do something about the binge? No, that's local council. Uh, okay, I-, I love you, Fiona. Thanks. And then just leave, right? Like that would have been campaigning up until now. But now you have Aussie Cossack with 100,000 people, just essentially just this one man, a current affair, just coming in and yeah. trying to trying to stumble you, right? Man, that guy, I, I just, I remember seeing a video of his a, a year ago and, he, and I looked at his subscriber count and then now seeing- how many views he gets and and how how uh, fast his subscriber count has grown. He's really tapped into something. Yeah, well, it's just that's the whole thing. Is look, confrontation definitely works. The other thing as well that you get with Aussie Cossack is the same thing. It's like he's definitely not a Russian nationalist. Is definitely not being <laughs> insincere in his beliefs, and it right. really does just go to show that like. It doesn't matter what the fuck you believe, as long as you truly believe it. Yeah, people, people are going to respect that. it. Yeah, yeah. It's just because again, it's it's a building block of trust. You know that, and I can never remember it, but the pyramid of, uh, of like human intimacy, basically, and at the bottom is just cliches. And then a little bit up from that is opinions. And then a little bit up from that is like hopes and desires. And then I think the top is when like you share your your deepest fears and insecurities with someone. But essentially, if you're just like giving your honest, the people that aren't giving their honest opinions are below the pyramid of not like they're not even halfway up the pyramid. Mm. They're well below. They're they're below a third of the pyramid up in terms of how much trust they can accumulate. And it's so simple, isn't it? Just be honest. But so many people. Yeah, here's what I because think. they're chasing that that sort of hit of, of of signaling to the tribe or whatever it may be, or just seeking the power so that rather manufacture what they may be saying as opposed to actually saying what they genuinely believe. And it seeps through. People can cut, catch on to that and. Again, coming back to someone like a Joe Rogan, look, that's a man who at least gives off a very clear indication that he's being honest and he isn't tainted by some other sort of interest or Machiavellian desire. He just wants to have a conversation, which is what a lot of his supporters will say, really, that just he just seems like a really nice, down-to-earth guy that's, that's similar to me. He likes the same things I like. He's... Uh, He's sort of he's he's quite calm and 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 stoic and and I don't agree with this assessment that he's a meathead. He's quite intelligent actually, and at least in the ones I've listened to, I think he's actually improved on his um broadcaster uh, eloquence a lot more in the past few years. It's uh, definitely true. If you watch if him you from ten years ago, ones. holy fuck. Yeah, but I think that you know but, what I think that you're right, and it's just that he. <sighs> You know, people say it dismissively as just being like, uh, he's a bro. But it's just like, yeah, but what else is there fucking entertainment other than brazzers? No, sorry, bang bros. (laughs) Bang bros. That's That's it. That's all they've got. I think there's this very, I don't know, man. Like, most of my friends who listen to him and and, uh, like him, they're not that kind of guy. Those kind of guys, I don't think they have the, like, the capacity to actually listen to a three-hour-long potentially intellectual conversation. I think they're actually just listening to maybe rap or I don't know. No, but they're but like standard. It's like a standard man. That's what I'm saying. Like if you, I don't know. Like then my concept of a bro is different. But like I'm just talking about your standard man that likes like boxing, MMA, right, sport. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, like powerful well, go, animals. Why cars. do you say that with? So much disdain. Yeah, because like, I'm, I'm, it, I'm a gay man. That's why I'm just to, like, yeah. to Yuck. analyze those things. So that's, <laughs> that, that gives you an insight into, you know, the Darwinian laws of nature. And, and what does? All of those things that you mentioned, the, the predatory animals and even something like MMA and boxing, it's seeing human beings at their rawest, most animalistic level, but in a very organized way. And it's yeah. a skill and yeah. it's 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 an art form in many ways. It's something that sure, I understand where a lot of people can see that it's gory and uh, there's a there's a form of bloodlust that comes with it. But it also it, it takes a, a high uh, 
higher order level of critical thinking and with very serious consequences. I think that's something he says anyway, but that is actually what, as someone who's dabbled in these sports, that's, that's what it is. It's not just blindly throwing punches to try and knock someone out. No, it's no, not no, a fight at the pub. No, it's definitely not fucking that. Like, dude, my dad was really into boxing and he used to sit down and break down what they were doing and you were just like, geez, they're, they're playing chess. Yeah. They're basically playing, like, at an elite level they are anyway. They, yeah. Except for, like, at the end of it you get brain damage. But <laughs> That's true. The, the thing is, like, <laughs> it, it's just it just doesn't personally appeal to me. Sure. Like, manly stuff doesn't appeal to me. But the thing is, is what you're pointing out as well is that, like, essentially, Jesus Christ, how podcasty is this? But it's definitely true. It, it just fucking is true. It's just, like, being a man is essentially a sin these days. Like, that's that's the media landscape. The media landscape is just filled with this attitude right. of, like, if you're a man, just go away. Like, can you please just stop existing? Yeah, and they that's wonder why young men want. don't trust them. And then sit there it's- and then just be like, well, it's because you're, like- it's because the- And then they gaslight yeah, us into yeah, yeah, thinking yeah. it's our fault. You're aggressive. Yeah. 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 It's that it's, kind of it's shit. It's pure gaslighting. But it's just like, yeah, maybe. Or maybe it's that you won't even give us the fucking footy show. You know, you you, you yeah, have, have to something. ruin that with a broad. You know, like there's it's just <laughs> why. And even then, if they'd had, uh, you know, Alana Ferguson, if they'd had uh, Ron Sims, if they had uh, even Yvonne Sampson, but just Erin Mullen, her commentary on the game, it had nothing to do with her being a woman. Her commentary on the game was not up to scratch. And you're dealing with a couple of former greats there. And th- all those other women I mentioned, except Yvonne, who's just a journalist, but the but others played the game at an elite level. But what's wrong with just having things that are kind of just exclusively sort of just a man's ill club or a woman's like- Well, yeah, because there's shows that tea cater- Tea party or whatever. Like, because it's- There the, are shows that cater exclusively to, to women. To women, but like a Plenty good example- I'll give you a good example, like in Australia, because I know that, you know, there's the view, but like our version of Studio 10 or whatever, right? Like uh-huh. Joe Hildebrand- for whatever fucking reasons I have against him or whatever, but, like, he did fucking ruin that show. It was just, like, why the fuck is there a straight man in between all these old biddies just sitting there being like, hey, yeah, 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 Pauline Hanch, yeah, 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 she's a hot topic, that one. It's just, like, dude, you're not naturally friends with 50-year-old women. Then it moved on to, and I was thought, yeah, okay, that, that makes a little more sense, just, like, some quaint Irish gay man or something like that. He can He can stay in there. But it's just like okay. there's just a thing where it's like, dude, the footy show, it's about fucking guys on the football field that got their pants pulled down accidentally and their cock flopped out. That's the fucking show. Yeah. The, well, they're trying to – I don't know whether they're doing it from an ethical point of view or they're just trying to bring in – a larger uh, consumer base, which is, I think, I think what they're really doing. They're trying to increase their profits, so they're pushing uh, a lot more women to to support NRL and similarly with AFL. Which I, don't, you know, that's a good thing. Many people would you say make but, your but, own like, girls only footy show then, but and it'd have a different true. flavor. They should probably do that. It would actually be better. It would be better. That would be fun because they'd be mo- they'd be like taking the piss out of the men a lot. So that would actually be a good commercial decision but dude i remember because i i don't know why i'm getting so passionate about this but i remember (laughs) watching the footy show as a kid and (laughs) it was dumb as fuck but it was it gave me a laugh and everything and then i watched it when they started putting chicks on it and like dude the vibe was wrong it was just wrong look i i can understand why a lot of people get mad about that and it was because people who who don't understand how much those forms of entertainment mean to people and not only um, denigrating that form of entertainment and sort of and then, and then bringing in these other elements for corporate interests at the end of the day. They may say, and at surface level, it's virtuous and ethical. You're trying to garner more profits at the end of the day. You're bringing in a different demographic and that's yeah. how these media corporate type speak. Mm. Sure, I'll say things like that as well, but they're just obsessed. They're laser focused. They don't see humans as individuals it's like you're part of a demographic and we need to try and garner in that demographic to increase our uh, ability to sell advertising space to harvey norman or whatever the fuck but it 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 was people that never probably watched the footy show never really watched nrl that never it never meant much to them trying to tell people what is entertainment and not only that actually making them feel bad for laughing at things that they find funny because it's oh, it's a bit. Whenever there's a sort of uniquely male entertainment space, it's it's 
always seen as problematic, problematic. But when there's a uniquely female entertainment space, it's not only seen as fine, it's actually it's seen as empowering, yeah. right? And, you know, make up your mind there. Like, I, I just... You can't sit there and say we're strong and independent, but then you get you you feel that it's some sort of affront to your, an assault on your autonomy to have a bunch of men laughing about, yeah, like you say, someone having their pants pulled down or something like yeah. that. And like it's uh, that's the perfect example of people who would have probably watched that show and no longer had entertainment. That and look, I'm a fucking brown young guy in the arts. I'm, you know, intellectually inclined. I'm. Look at me. I'm. I'm wearing this fucking, b- you know, bougie necklace that's made for women. And even I was like, yeah, this is fucking. These are full of pussies now. Like, if yeah. I'm thinking that, yeah. how much is the average tradie Holy thinking shit. that? Like, I'm thinking that. Fuck. And I'm one of the. I'm not that masculine, right? Yeah. Like you say, like when people like you dabble in this hyper masculine tone or something it's like you think jordan is hyper masculine yeah. like <laughs> wow dude like you are so far removed from the average australian <laughs> blog <laughs> <laughs> like i get it if you were like oh <laughs> isaac butterfield's hyper masculine like i can see how a six foot eight bearded cunt would be intimidating for some people but yeah. <laughs> but you but me <laughs> Virtually a woman. Virtually. Jesus. It's too masculine. <laughs> that's, that's saying something on them. And, uh, yeah, it really. Like, so, but again, but again, the group think of Channel 9. That's how Channel yeah. 9 thinks. Yeah. And, and, and so it's basically, if you're a man, of- you have to just be this kind of nugget with a mouth. Right. And again, like, I think the people who are actually calling the shots in a lot of these stations. Would still, I mean, you're, you're talking about your Murdochs or whatever, the, the, the people who are probably moving that capital who don't really care what show is doing well, just as long as our show is doing well so they can maintain their relationship with the advertisers. I don't think they care. But I'm talking about the people who are sort of in mid-level management and, and those sorts of middle powerful positions in media. In my experience... There, it's female dominated, and and then the men who are there, are, you know, you you sort of more metrosexual hipster types. Those like either early millennials, late Gen Z, basically a noodle. They're not men. Yes, they're very yeah, noodly they're weak. I mean, I am. I've, I'll <laughs> even say this: I'm hyper masculine in comparison to them. That is not saying anything on me. It is just saying I know these people and like. Most scenarios that I walk into, I'm just like, that guy could beat me up. That guy could beat me up. But I walk into those situations and I'm just like, yeah, I feel fine. Like, I, I really could kick the shit out of any of these right. guys. <laughs> you know, like, it's usually yeah. them. Unless well, you walk good. into, like, you know, Fox Sports or something, obviously. Yeah, but even then, that's, like, kind of the, the guys who probably got beaten up by the footy boys. Oh, school. yeah, fuck well, yeah. all of us, any man in media is, like, a guy who got beaten up by the footy boys at yeah. school, let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's something like again. I just reflect on the fact that I'm having those same thoughts. I can only imagine what's going through a, you know, a bloke mind. from Penrith, yeah. who who you know the NRL means as much as like the bourgeoisie scoff at the love for sport that the proletariat have. It mm. means a lot to people. It's it's a it's not just a source of entertainment. It's a it's a tribal association. It's it's a big part of their life. And when you kind of toy with that it it's not gonna bode well with them like this is something that really does mean a lot to people and you can't you try and understand as much as these people try and understand every other culture why don't you try and understand that culture more than a surface level oh just a bunch of meatheads love people running into each other well Which i think it, is, it, look, it, it is that. genuinely <laughs> it, you <laughs> but, know what it, it genuinely comes from that same thing that you were talking about in a previous podcast where you were just saying that some people are so within their own culture and the thing that's particularly infuriating about culture now is that they're the ones that are just constantly talking about how we accept other cultures and all that kind yes, of shit. Yes, it's cultural relativism when it suits their narrative, but when it doesn't suit their narrative, no, there's an objective truth to a culture. No, it is in their culture. culture. Yeah. No, it, it, their culture is to say we're culturally accepting, but their fucking version of we're culturally accepting is we have brown people and Aboriginal people and lesbians from our fucking culture. 
Yes. That's what it is. It's surface level In diversity. Fact, actually, yeah. now that I think about it, you know who would really help out the footy show if you wanted a female? Some dyke from Penrith. That'd be fucking gold. Be hilarious. Yeah. Well, that's like a woman. That's that- a fucking, but it's just, it's not the right woman. You, you know, know what it, uh, it seems to be occurring now? I don't know if you tell me, because you're someone who has a, like a larger degree of class consciousness, I think, than I do. But there seems to be a uh, what was previously split along gender lines, you know, when you talk about normal, uh, sorry, traditional aspects of masculinity and what the, men would as- aspire to in yesteryear and what maybe were traditional aspects of femininity. It's now separating along class lines more than anything. Working class men and women are both masculine as fuck. Yeah. Like working class women love the footy now. Yeah. And they all, they're, they're actually beasts on the footy field. Like when you watch women's NRL, mm. that's that's a different breed of woman to the woman mm-hmm. who are like, we should support women's NRL who would never fucking watch, watch it, it in their life. Yeah. You know, I'm not like, uh, fuck, they're more masculine than me. Mm. When I wrote that, well, it was. I like to call it a bull, but it was technically a steer for any uh, farmers listening Dang, yeah. uh, for that show. And then uh, I remember getting off and I was like, fuck, I can't believe I did it. Fuck, I actually was on a bull. And then I swear to God, this country girl was just like, oh, it was only a steer. Harden the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't. Like, yeah. this culture is so, I can't, like, I don't even know what to say. I know. Like, I'm from Sydney here. I'm, I'm riding a wild animal. Yeah. Let me have my moment of glory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I t- and then that same girl. Oh, no. this, this, I met a guy there uh, who I don't even know where he's. He just travels around Australia doing farm work, essentially, like bringing in bulls into, into like, these uh, the fucking pen. I don't know, whatever it's called. And they all come in there with their, like, utes. And they're, it's so country. It's fucking amazing. And then... um. Uh, for the start of the day, I was talking to him. He recognized me from some videos and then uh, he goes off for an hour or two and I'm like, fuck, where did he go? Where did Danny go, right? And then comes out later. He's got this girl with him and then they're just chatting a bit. And then she goes off somewhere and he's like, fuck, just rooted her, eh? And I'm like, "What? did, did you know it? And he's like, no. Nope. There's just some rodeo where they just met an hour or two ago and a mad root. In it, either a tend or their ute, and that was the girl that was like, "Oh, it's a, it's a steer harden up." <laughs> I'm like, "This amazing, this? amazing, <laughs> amazing." <laughs> this is why country people are like, "Oh, you city slickers don't know what it's like." Yeah, we do. Like, I don't. Yeah, I, no, that that is, like, dude, I was actually legitimately that? shocked. I was yeah. just like, I've, <laughs> I've never been in a scenario where I can just walk up to a girl and fuck them in a bathroom <laughs> after <laughs> for an hour. It was pretty impressive, man. Yeah, I got to admit. Yeah. But it's, it's just like, like I, it's like it's like a joke in my mind. It's that absurd. Yeah, you know, it's not. It's and I'm not, not close to reality. I'm not making fun of it. Like this was that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. That's truly amazing. And yes. and like so, what I'm trying to say is like, do you think there's like a sort of because working class now is very masculine for both men and women. Like you talk to a working class woman, and I'm not I'm, I'm not talking about. You know, my parents were teachers. I'm talking about like I grew up with a single mother in Penrith. Mm. Right. That's a. They're very masculine in temperament. They'll like look you in the eye and stand up and like argue with you for days on end. They'll insult you. They'll be very loud. They'll be very confident. They'll go after what they want. But then you look at men in the sort of managerial, you know, white collar class or whatever you want to call it. And women, they're f- becoming the feminine aspect of society as a class. They really are. I mean, this is a very shallow observation. I'm sure there'll be people who are going to contend with this, but that's that seems to be what's happening. It's like working class Australia, both men and women, are like highly masculine. And now in, the, in this day and age, I don't know if just being having masculine attributes means you're a man now. So then they're the men, and then. The, they're the women, like in, we're, you know, we're the women. Dude, it's really weird how they're always just talking media, about the patriarchy. Talk. <laughs> I know, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Bitching. Feminine as fuck, yeah, we just bitch. We just sit here and bitch. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're not wrong, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what was like a very, it was a very interesting thing to me, and I've got to read more about it, but ancient China. 
you notice this, it's, it's, it's a thing that sort of just naturally happens is that once society kind of just settles and and civilizes, I suppose, and stops becoming expansionary and less war- warlike, essentially Chinese, the Chinese palace where all the power was, was a boy, em- more or less just a boy emperor for hundreds of years uh, that never really made it to adulthood. If they made it to adulthood, it would be an exception. Uh, if they made it to the adulthood, they were kind of just encouraged to just sit around in, in harems all day, basically just live in a complete fantasy world. And then they just, it was really creepy and weird. They just play yeah, around with fully this. grown hot yeah. women all day. Yeah. yeah. Whereas they come from a Confucian tradition that I've um, been reading one of those little summaries of Confucianism. And it's all about how if you are the leader, you need to embody the the values that you hope to instill into your subordinates better than anyone else. You mm. need to be the example mm. and the leader. And mm. that seems to have clearly decayed if it's a kid in, <laughs> in, a, in a little sex palace. In a weird sex palace <laughs> where, like, these two factions of empresses and eunuchs were constantly fighting. And now I just can't unsee it. Every time I ever see anyone in Australian Parliament now, I just see a bunch of women being like, <laughs> and a bunch of men being like, <laughs> you know, like, this is, <laughs> that's that's most of them there, you know, like, it's just <laughs> crows and nuggets, eunuchs and empresses. Yeah, well, that's the, all the, I the, see. The sort of middle class, uh, w- jo- Jonathan Haidt, The Coddling of the American Mind is a great book because, like, you know, for, for Gen X and Gen Y onwards, uh, if you grew up middle class, you, you, you had a very cuddled and protected and safe upbringing. There's all the anti-bullying campaigns and you were not playing outside as much as your parents were and you, you probably had a more maternalistic upbringing in the sense that many fathers now are completely pussified and have yeah. no say in how they discipline their children. Yes. And, you know, oh, shoes of the boss, that kind of thing. And, you know, you, you, you sort of, you're not, there's not a lot of free play. That's his big assertion. There's no longer a lot of free play. That can be quite hard for, for kids, and it, but it forces them to, forces their brain to develop in a different way. And it also forces them to become a lot highly uh, independent and be able to, soothe their own negative emotions better than, say, someone who's been spoon-fed throughout their childhood and adolescence who may be quite conscientious and do the right things, if you will. But Mm. I think you can see it in people who can't handle these new media platforms, right? They're they're always – they're never trying to contend with them one-on-one and thinking, all right, let's observe this phenomenon and try and understand how we can either beat it or how we can contend with it. It's always, oh, authorities, can you do something? Yeah. And that's- It's telling. It's a symptom of someone who's sort of been, had things, you know, had a path kind of cleared for them. Fucking hell, I didn't even think about that. That's so true. They're always, essentially, they're, yeah, they're always like, mum, do something, dad, do something. Yeah. Yeah. That's their go-to. Their go-to. And it's the same thing. Every time they're trying to cancel me, it's always- Like, I've, I felt it before. I did. It was just like this- It's it's fucking prefects at school just being like, Miss Jordan. You know, like, it's that. <laughs> it, it's that. It's pathetic. Yeah. Well, who am I- I was reading, I'm reading a book on Camille Parlia right now. She had a great quote in there in the first chapter. I, I, I'm sorry if I butcher this, but it was something along the lines of like the- the modern progressive wisdom is that the um, the government and the bureaucracy is paternalistic, but they expect it to act in a very maternalistic way. Yeah. And that's the sort of bourgeois liberal ethos. Yeah. Which isn't very liberal when you're asking a bureaucracy to come and help you, especially if it's a government bureaucracy. It's actually quite... In fact, you don't care about that word at all, really. No. If you can expand the government to try and live a liberal... <laughs> Way that that's completely counterintuitive and just blatant doublespeak, but that's a very. I think that's quite a poignant point. It's it's that you're asking the government to essentially be somewhat of a father figure 
and this sort of protective entity to ensure that, you know, the, the world is sort of moulded in a way that is most comfortable for you. Now, there's something to be said there. Like, you, you can't completely have a lawless society, but... But I don't think... But, man, now I'm thinking about it, I don't think it's a conscious decision. Comes from their upbringing subconsciously. They're it's just, just they're, they're subconsciously that. just... Yeah, that's, that's how they expect... That's their view of the world. And so they think that... Okay, my my parents can't do this. What's the next authority figure that can stop this? Like, I don't like this. I'll get someone else to stop it. Yeah. Weird. As opposed to, I suppose, the point of just like letting children just run around and just wrestle with each other and every now and then an eye gets poked out and that kind of stuff. Like, (laughs) in that, as Jordan Peterson always says, they kind of just learn- yeah. Dynamics. Yeah. How, how it is dangerous, but you learn, you grow from it. And I suppose those people don't have that. In- because it's the same thing. It's just like every time anyone ever has ever tried to sue or ever tried to write like a slander piece or anything like that, my author- my, my, my immediate instinct is to not go to a judge. My immediate instinct isn't to not pass a law to stop that from happening. Like, my immediate instinct is kind of just like, yeah, okay, let's just have this out, you know? It's it's right. like, but some, but their fucking immediate instinct is stop this. It's not even to engage. It's just like, it's it's just like, th- this has to be ended now. It's, it's, it's fragile. It's, it's, it is weak. It's so fucking weak. It's so weak. Because we're not even dealing with physical intimidation here. No, but, but the thing is, and it's not this is what's so pathetic. It's- they, they, they word it as physical intimidation. They word it every time as just like, this is bullying. This is menacing. This is like, I feel threatened. Like, they use those kind of words. And it's just like, really? Well, that's fucking pathetic. For the people who represent millions of people, that is really pathetic. And Piss pure poor, and- yeah. Infantile, really. It's, Infantile. I don't know what, what happened in your adolescence and even your 20s, but I'm you should be guess. able to cope with things like that. And not only that, if you're the cream of the crop, if you're an elected official, you should be able to uh, contend with it quite comfortably. But that's the whole thing. It's just it's handed to them. Yeah. Everything's just fucking handed to them. Well, and then as soon as something isn't handed to them, they're just like, no, mum. Because as politicians now, the system we currently live in is not people who've accrued social capital on first a local level and then within their given community. I mean, sure, there may be some that have, but they've actually just schemingly built a faction within their little bubble. So they've gone through the motions. They haven't, and this is the biggest criticism, which is totally fair, Like they, they, that people should actually probably work in the public sector for a few years if they want to go into government, but... Uh, they've probably gone to uni politics. They've probably then just gone on to become a staffer. Mm. Probably then sucked enough dicks, metaphorically, or in the Liberal Party, probably. Probably physically, yeah. And, and then they've become handpicked to be the uh, candidate for a certain seat. And then based on the brand and not their personal brand, if you, if you want to use that corporate terminology, just based on the Liberal or the Labor brand... They either get elected or they don't, and then they're in the system. What have you shown there? And that, in that, I mean, say what you want about someone like a Malcolm Turnbull, but he did build, like, he did make all this wealth himself first, and then went into politics. Well, and it's very evident something. that then he goes into the Labor Party, and he kind, of, sorry, Liberal Party, and then he just bulldozes his way to the top, hmm. which shows that he actually has. There's a way of doing things. In fact, people just sat him around and said to him in the Liberal Party, there's a way of doing things here. And, you know, you play your cards right, one day you'll be on the front bench, all that kind of stuff. And because he was from a dog-eat-dog world of the corporate sector and actually not just the corporate sector, not just like going onto boards of companies that already existed, although he did do that, but inventing his own investment firm, I suppose. It does show a level of ruthlessness that just didn't yeah. exist in the system before, so he just bolted to the front. Yeah. Whether whether we we can argue about the ethics of it, but it was he showed uh, initiative 
at the very least. Yeah. And in a paved culture that is completely molded in inertia and there is the Yeah, there's that there's that really easy going decorum thing. Mm. Well, uh this has been it's been a great podcast. This has been I hope you've enjoyed the second part of the Social Capital Podcast. Um I feel like we could go on for hours on this topic and we'll probably revisit it. Um, we, we did cover topics that we always talk about. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it too. But now that I'm thinking about Prime Ministers, I've just got to say, Kevin Rudd accumulated social capital because he's just constantly campaigning on something. Malcolm Turnbull, to a lesser extent, doing the same thing. Other Prime Ministers, they're kind of just gone. Nothing now. Mm. But anyway, yeah, sorry, we'll continue. But that's another example, I think, of just like, yeah, social capital, you can... It's what you should be you can wield looking it. for. Yeah, it should... Financial capital will serve you and it won't... will serve you material, materially. It won't serve you spiritually. It won't serve you uh, collectively. It won't serve the but people social around you. It might will do serve all the people. It. it will serve the people around you. But yeah, social capital will do all of that. And most likely have the result, the net result of actually accruing a lot of financial capital as well. Hmm. So think about that. All right, come see me live, uh, neildan.com. We're getting really good at improv. Going to be the next, that's our vision. Biggest improvisers to come out of Australia. So, Neil Dan. Well, it's probably already mission accomplished. Yeah, I mean, there's not that. <laughs> who else is who there? Who else is there? <laughs> well, Andrew O'Keefe, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Andrew O'Keefe. He's, okay, he's we'll lost all day. his social capital. Let's yeah, say he that. doesn't have much left. <laughs> all right. Uh, yes, neildan.com. Sydney, Melbourne, monthly. Western Sydney, monthly coming soon as well. Fuck uh, yeah. Coming soon. So, Newcastle. Uh, and if you know any venues in Canberra, if you, if you maybe run events in Canberra or if you sort of maybe know of a bar or anything, if, if you could just help me out in any way, s- send me an email. We're looking to start up a regular room there as well and go see Jordan live and we'll see you next time, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, gang.